to a very, very familiar passage of Scripture for this season. And I want to highlight just one phrase out of this verse. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Now, later on in the, in the message, I'm going to ask you a question. What was the best Christmas present you ever received? Now, just think about it for a moment. What was the best Christmas present you ever received? The first time I was asked that question, I thought about a toy cannon I got. And it shot bullets like this big. I mean, they were plastic, but it was pretty cool. And then my second favorite was this uh, army set. And as I started thinking of all my favorite presents, they all were kind of violent. And I thought, I don't know, maybe that's not the best kind of presents to be celebrating Christmas with. But what was the best gift that you ever received at Christmas time? We're going to tie that in later on. But Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, very familiar passage. And there's one phrase that I want to really zero in on and highlight. Uh, Verse 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, I'm not preaching on this, but that last phrase always catches my attention. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In other words, God says, I'm making this prophecy, and I am really excited about bringing it to pass. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, if you think back to the story of Luke, Luke chapter 2. The shepherds are out in the field at night, and they're watching their flock by night. And the angel appears unto them, do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Listen to verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I believe there's a parallel there. Isaiah said, unto us, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And now Luke says, unto you. Unto you, born this day in Bethlehem, house of bread, there is a Savior, Christ the Lord. See, one is looking forward to it, and the other one is announcing that it is happening right then and there. Unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. Well, here's the phrase that I I really, it's meant so much to me over the last few years. Notice all the different names, the description of his name, and his name shall be called. And it gives quite a few, and we could get really in-depth over each one of them. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. But the one that fascinates me is Everlasting Father. That Jesus, this is clearly about Jesus, that Jesus is called Everlasting Father. Now remember when he was talking to his Uh, disciples. He said to them, in preparing them for his going away, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come unto you. In other words, he was trying to tell, I'm going to die. I'm going to be cut off, but I'm going to come unto you. And, And here's the first point that I want to make. Jesus is our everlasting Father. If you want to know what God the Father is like, now, we, we get all in, in our minds, you know, the Trinity and the Godhead, and, and it's so mysterious, and it's hard to figure all that out. But if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. God is called our Father, but now Jesus is called our everlasting Father. And he says, I will not leave you as orphans. Do you realize that God gave his Son to us twice? Unto us a child is born, unto us A son is given. Well, when he brought Jesus into the world in Bethlehem, that was one time he gave him. But then when he suffered and died on the cross, God was giving his son a second time. And that's when we can say, and he's Christ the Lord. He's our Savior, born unto you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior. But here's an interesting thing. In Isaiah chapter 53, I think all evangelicals would agree that Isaiah chapter 53 is about Jesus, is about the suffering Messiah, 
It's about the one who would bear our sins and, and, and he, would, he, would, he would take care of our iniquities. He would be bruised for our, our peace and the chastisement for our peace. But it says in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8 that he will be cut off and who will declare his generation. What does that mean? It means he's going to be cut off before he has children. So who's going to declare his generation? Jesus was never married. Jesus, not being married, never uh, gave, uh, never, never fathered any children. And yet in that same passage, Isaiah 53, 10, it says, And he shall see his seed and prolong his days. Think of that for a moment. He's going to be cut off, and there's no one to declare his generation, but he will see his seed and prolong his days. So he will have children. Now, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, when you look at these Old Testament prophecies, when they were given, they're always kind of obscure. But now we look back and read into them from New Testament light. But in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, it says, I and the children the Lord has given me will be a witness unto you. And in Hebrews chapter 2, the Spirit, the Scripture interprets Scripture, the Spirit uses that same passage about Jesus. That he says, the, the children which the Lord has given me will be a witness, will be a testimony. So Jesus has children. Jesus is an everlasting father. Now, we know in the Old Testament, God's called a father. He's called a father to the fatherless, and, and the fatherless find mercy in him. Several promises of God being a father to those who are fatherless, and even God being a father to Israel. In Isaiah 63, 15, doubtless you are our father. Though Abraham was ignorant of us and Israel does not uh, acknowledge us, you are our father. And now notice this, our Redeemer. Well, who's the Redeemer? Jesus. Jesus is everlasting Father. In the woman's tea, Lorraine gave a beautiful testimony. Uh, I, I almost had her come give it again today, but, you know, once she gets wound up, I never get the pulpit. I would never get the pulpit back. But she gave a beautiful testimony about her dad. There, there are a few things about her dad that are just wonderful. He was, he was from the city. He's from Torty Toyd Street, and he always talked like that. And, and he was like one of these rough guys, you know. And, and whenever I think of him, I see him in a white T-shirt and blue jeans. He was a contractor. He was a builder. The only time he put on a nice shirt was to go to church. And he never had his tie right. He never looked, he never looked right in a tie because that was not who he was. But he would stand in that congregation of Smithtown Gospel Tabernacle and he would sing with the worst voice you could ever imagine. I believe that demons fled that church just because of that voice. Only kidding. But he loved the Lord with all his heart. Amazing grace. And his voice would always crackle. And tears would always come down his cheeks. He got good saved. But before he got saved, he was a drunk. He counted at least 11 times he should have been dead by his own count. I can't verify that. That's his count. But 11 times he says he should have been dead. And, and, and alcohol was destroying his life. And even though alcohol was destroying his life, Lorraine says when she thinks of her childhood, she remembers one thing. Dad was always there. Even as a drunk, he was always there. He always came home at night. Sometimes he had to crowbar the kitchen window open because he was drunk and his wife locked him out. And he slid across the floor and banged his head on the cupboard across. But he was home at night. And every summer, there were family vacations, laughter in the car, doing things with the kids. And every Christmas, no matter how hard he struggled for money, the room was full of presents and laughing and joy. Even though he was a drunk, he loved his kids, and he was always there. And then one day, we don't know exactly what happened, but his organs began to shut down, and he wasn't there. As great a man as he was, he's not everlasting, Father. All of us in this room probably will go through that, won't we, where, where we, we, we look at the dad who brought us up and, and we realize that we're going to outlive that man. And, and he, as great as our dads are, they're not everlasting, Father. I'll never forget the quote of my dad when I, I asked him about the day his dad died. I saw him weep when he heard the news. I'd never seen him cry like that before. He wept like a little baby. And I said, Dad, what was that day like for you? And he said, Mark, let me put it to you like this. You always think you'll have a dad, and then one day the phone rings, and you don't. No matter how good a dad you have, no matter how good a dad you are, we're not everlasting, Father. 
But Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, I saw something I never saw about this verse. In Revelation 21, 7, it's talking about overcomers. And Jesus said, I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, I know you've heard that before. I will be his God, and he will be my son, the one that overcomes. But think about when that is being said. That's Revelation 21. That's at the end of all things. That's when time has been wrapped up and eternity has begun. And even in eternity, he says, I will be his God and he will be my son. He will be, Jesus will be everlasting father. He will not leave us as orphans. Now, here's the problem that many of us have. It's what psychologists sometimes call transfer. Let's say, for example, that you had a dad that was harsh, a dad that was not involved, a dad that was aloof, or a dad that was outright abusive. That was the authority figure of dad in your life. Now someone comes along and says, God is your father. And you have all these negative feelings of God doesn't care, God is harsh, God is a... You've transferred your feelings to a bad earthly dad upon God as your father. But this will set you free. Jesus. See, Jesus is very specific, isn't he? We can go to the Gospels and we can look at who Jesus is. How many of you would raise your hand and say, as I think of the Gospels, I would be absolutely positive Jesus is kind. How many would agree with that? That Jesus is loving, that Jesus is powerful, that Jesus is good, that Jesus wants to be involved in people's lives. This is our Father. We need to get that old image of a harsh, aloof, angry, never can you please me kind of God. We need to get that out of our mind and see Jesus as our everlasting Father. Unto you a child is born. Unto you, it's a gift to you. Unto you a son is given. And his name shall be called Everlasting Father. Point number two on your, on your outline. Just jot this down. Our Father is a good giver. How many of you were glad at Christmas time if you had a dad that was a good giver? Our Father, yeah, we got a couple of hands. You said, I had good Christmas. Lorraine's dad was a good giver even before he got saved. And man, he was a great giver after he got saved. Her dad was a good giver. I don't know how many times in the early days of our ministry, we didn't have a vehicle or we didn't have something, and somehow he'd just pull up with it and say, here it is. He was a good giver. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that Jesus is our everlasting Father, and our Father is a good giver. Matter of fact, James 1.17, every, every, Good gift is from above. Fill that in. Every, not, not just some. Every good gift is from above. We know from the scriptures that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, God is love. And God so loved, he did what? He gave. God's very nature is love, and God's very nature is to be a giver. And John, uh, James rather, 115, says that he gives liberally. He doesn't scold you as he's giving. He doesn't upbraid you as he's giving. He's, he's a liberal giver. Our God is a good giver, and this sets us free to, to experience a lot of things. Now, how does God give? I want to separate this into two different ways. A, on your study guide there, write in the word providential. I'm only going to touch on this. I'm not going to spend much time, but God takes providential care. The providential care of God. What does that mean? Well, that means he takes care of nature. He takes care of his universe. He, did any of you worry that the earth wasn't going to rotate enough for the sun to come up this morning? Did, did any of you just lie in bed trembling and say, I'm afraid to look out the window. I, I'm afraid it'll still be dark. And then we're going to freeze to death. We're all going to die. This global warming is terrible. No, we believe that God takes providential care over his creation. He feeds the birds. He, he takes care of Job 38, 41. He provides food uh, for the ravens. He causes the rain to go on the just and the unjust. God takes care of his creation. Psalm 136 says, who gives food to all flesh. 
Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. Aren't you glad for God's providential care? That God is sovereign. That God has this whole universe under his complete control. The providential care of God. But most of the time, that's an encouraging thought, but it doesn't always do us a lot of good. Letter B, God's specific care. I have a specific need, not just to know that the birds will be fed, but I have a specific need. Doesn't the Bible say, cast all your care on him, for he cares for you? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus gave this great teaching on prayer. Ask and shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on uh, uh, knocking. But then he, he concluded that by saying this. If you being evil, unregenerate, not born again, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, even Lorraine's dad before he was born again, he knew how to give good gifts to his children. How much more will your heavenly Father, your everlasting Father, give good gifts to those who ask? And I want to give you an all-encompassing promise. 2 Peter 1.3 God has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Think of that. God has given unto us all things that pertain to to life and godless. Whatever you need to live your life, he's he's provided. But now let's take it a step further. Whatever you need to be a godly person, whatever you need to live righteously, whatever you need to be a godly man, a godly woman, he has given us all that we need for life and godliness. What a great promise that is. Every specific need we can cast on him knowing that he cares for us. There are those that say, well, pastor, you know, I work hard for my money. God doesn't just drop this money from heaven. Um, I got my education, and, and I'm a self-made man. Well, wait, wait a minute. Let's back up a little bit. Where did you get your brain? You had to have some ability to be able to get an education. And who decided what culture you would be born in? Who decided what time in history you'd be born in? Who decided what country you'd be born in? What economic status you'd be born into? Who determined all that? Who determined the influences upon your life? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, God says this. When you come into the land that's flowing with milk and honey, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God because it is him who gives you the power to get wealth. And the Bible says, what do you have that you did not receive? And why then are you acting as if you did not receive it? If you and I have anything, it's because of God's goodness in our life. If you got an education, it's because of who you were born unto and the opportunities that you had, many of which you had nothing to do with. Yes, you had to take advantage of it. Yes, you had to seize the day, carpe diem. But the opportunity was provided for you from beyond yourself. That's, that's the goodness of God. And we ought to praise him every day. The enemy is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So cast your care upon him. He cares for you. John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from above. Last point on this, on this issue is that God, letter D, God freely gives. God freely gives. I has not seen, nor has ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And he goes on to say, you haven't received the spirit of the world. You've received the spirit of Christ. And by that spirit, you might know the things that he has freely given you. And God, who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely freely give us all things what does God have to do to convince us that he's a free giver he gave his son he gave the ultimate Luke chapter 12 one of my favorite verses a beautiful preaching verse verse 32 fear not little flock it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom did you catch that his good pleasure God takes pleasure in giving the kingdom to his children Fear not, little flock. No good thing will he withhold to those who walk 
uprightly. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son. But I want to remind you, this son is everlasting father. This son is Christ the Lord. This son is Savior. Given twice, once in Bethlehem and secondly at Calvary. God is our Father. Jesus is our everlasting Father. Now, I want to tell you a story. I always enjoy telling this story. I haven't told it in years. Those of you that have heard it, act surprised. What is the best gift you ever received at Christmas? Best gift you ever received. I sat down to interview my dad one day, and it was a glorious time together. If you have a dad that's still alive and you can do it, why don't you sit down and interview him, buy him a cup of coffee, and just ask him questions about his childhood, about his dad, and, and the influence of his life. And I just wrote out a bunch of questions, and, and one of them had to do with, well, what was Christmas life like, and what was the best gift you ever received for Christmas? He didn't have to think at all. He said, it was the year I asked for a Tonka truck. Anybody remember the ton- metal Tonka truck? His dad, Andrew Bratcher, did all his, most of his shopping at a little general store, And they had a few little toys in there. And dad went with him one day, and there he spotted this metal Tonka truck. And dad decided that would be the perfect gift because it's metal. Most of the other presents were wood and and metal, man. It won't break. And he could imagine himself playing in the gravel and the dirt. He was just a little guy with that metal uh, Tonka truck. And so each year, here's what grandpa would do. He was a very practical man. I'm calling his dad grandpa. Here's what grandpa would do. He was a very practical man. He didn't believe there was money to waste on toys you might not like. So he said, you pick out one toy. You, you, you find out how much it costs. has to be within a certain range. But you pick out one toy at, that you really want, and you tell me that toy. Because I'm not going to buy something that you might not like. Very practical. But here's the deal. If it was a bad year, you didn't get anything. Well, you got some candy or some walnuts. And there were years like that where the farming wasn't so good and they didn't get a present. They just got some candy or some nuts. And yet they still had a great time. But if it was a good year, you might get that one present you ask for, but only one. And so dad thought they were having a good year and he boldly asked for that Tonka truck and he really looked forward to getting that Tonka truck. Now their Christmas Eve was a beautiful tradition. How many of you have traditions on Christmas Eve that you do the same things every year? Well, here's what they would do. They would load up the kids, there were six of them, load up the kids and their Sunday best and drive down to the Reformed Church a few miles away for a Christmas Eve service. And Dad loved singing the hymns. And then after that service, they'd come back, and while they're changing out of their Sunday best, Grandma would start a very special meal. This was the greatest meal of the year, in Dad's opinion, and only had two items in it. Perfectly grilled in butter, grilled cheese sandwiches thick and gooey so thick and gooey you had to have a gulp of cold milk after every bite and you could have as many of them as you wanted and the other item was sugar cookies fresh out of the oven sugar cookies I learned a lesson that my dad learned maybe a little late men be very careful how you praise your mother in front of your wife Have you figured that one out? Be very careful how you praise your mother in front of your wife. Because dad would always boast on those sugar cookies. Whenever we went to grandma's house, he would take one and he'd hold it up. I still remember him looking at it and he'd turn over and say, perfectly baked, not burnt even a little. (laughs) He delighted in those sugar cookies. And I could see the frustration on mom's face because hers were always brown or black on the bottom. (laughs) Never praise your mother to your wife. Be very careful. So that was the tradition. But there was one thing that Dad was really bothered by about Christmas Eve. And that was Grandpa would never go to church with them. Now, Grandpa was a God-honoring man. Grandpa read the Bible. Grandpa observed the Sabbath, one of the few farmers in the area that wouldn't harvest on the Sabbath. I mean, Grandpa was a God-fearing man, and yet on Christmas Eve, when the children got in the car with, Gra- with Mom, now Dad's mom, Grandpa never came. And Dad noticed this after a couple of times, and it troubled him. And so the year he asked for the yellow Tonka truck, he also got up the nerve. He didn't want his dad to think he was accusing him of being a bad Christian. 
of saying, Dad, how come you never come to church with us on Christmas Eve? And Grandpa Andrew said, well, Edward, uh, I'm not going to tell you, but I'll show you. Why don't you skip church tonight and just come with me? Now, Dad wrestled with that. I mean, he's going to skip church, but he's with his dad. I mean, it must be okay. So he's going to skip church. And as soon as his sisters and brother got into the car and, and off, they went to the Reformed Church candlelight service. Grandpa got into another car. Dad got in that car. Down the gravel road they went, and Grandpa wouldn't tell him where they are going. He just kept driving. And then they pulled down this lane to this big, big building. Dad had never seen a house so big, but it was a really big kind of house-like building. Parked in a parking lot, and Grandpa said, Okay, Edward, now I need your help. And he popped the trunk, and they went and opened the trunk, and it was full of Christmas presents, neatly wrapped Christmas presents. They had pulled into a Catholic orphanage. And here's what Grandpa would do without anybody but maybe his wife and the general store owner knowing it and the priest. Every year throughout the year when he'd sell some milk or dairy products or whatever, he would go down to that general store and he'd buy a toy and have them set it aside and get it wrapped. And on Christmas Eve, he'd take those toys out to the orphanage. Now, I don't know this as a fact. I, I didn't interview Dad. Dad didn't have all the details. But I had to wonder if, if even years his own kids didn't get a present. I wonder if the orphanage did. It was something that Grandpa just thought he should do was make sure that orphans had a present at Christmas time. So dad helped him carry all these packages in. And dad had never seen an orphan. And he saw all these orphans coming in. And, and, and the priest and grandpa were kind of... And then he, he, he noticed how happy the orphans were. They were excited. They saw the presents. But then there's one more scraggling in behind him all. He looked very sullen. He looked very sad. He looked up. Dad looked up at his dad. And dad was troubled. Dad was counting. And then he heard his dad say to the priest, I thought you said you had 22 and the priest said, yes, but that one just came in today. Just a couple hours ago, I had no time to make any preparation, so I guess that one just won't get one. And Dad heard those words, that one just might not get one. And it troubled him. What would it be like to be the only kid not to get one? And so Dad spoke up, and he said, isn't there any more presents? Isn't there something we could do? And Grandpa said, well... There is one more present. Well, good, let's give it to that boy. Well, that's your decision, Edward, but before you do, before you decide, you need to know what it is. By the spare tire under that red and black blanket, there's one more package that was hidden, and inside it is a metal Tonka truck. It's your present. And if you want to give it to him, it's your present. You can give it to him. But we'll understand if you don't want to give it to him. And Dad looked over at that little oven where he, he thought about how much he wanted that truck. All he had to do was leave it in the trunk, and it would soon be under the tree. But then he said, I'll give me the keys. I'll, I'll go get it. And the priest allowed Dad to walk across the room and hand that package to that little orphan boy who didn't want to take it at first. He, he looked down, and Dad would say words like, Merry Christmas, or this is yours, or here, or and finally, the little boy looked up, and he very slowly took it, and he started unwrapping it very slowly, almost like it would explode or something. He was afraid to even open it. But Dad said that the, the, the smile that spread across that little boy's face when he pulled out that metal Tonka truck. They, they watched him from across the room before they had to go back and beat the family home for grilled cheese and sugar cookies. And when they went into the, the living room that night under the fresh-cut tree, there wasn't a present for Edward. His brother had one, his sisters had one, but he, he didn't have one, and he wouldn't get one either. They hardly noticed that he didn't have one. They were so excited about theirs. But he said that was the best Christmas he ever had because the smile on that orphan's face and the memory of that smile was the best present he ever got. He didn't get a present that. Now, Dad had told me that story, and we have a, a beautiful candlelight service as we've invited you to. And, and one year, he was here visiting us for that service, and it occurred to me that my youngest son was approximately the same age as he was when he gave that Tonka truck away. So what I did is I went out, and I found a metal Tonka truck. And I wrapped it up, and I put it under the tree on the stage. And at the end of the candlelight service, I called my youngest up who got that package and walked out and presented it to him. And Dad's eyes watered over when he opened it up and saw a metal Tonka 
truck. And it wasn't because he was delighting in the truck. He was remembering the smile on that orphan boy's face. And that truck was by my dad's favorite chair almost the rest of his life. When they had to sell their house and downsize, that truck went with them. When they had to move out of the apartment to assisted care, that truck went with them. Even in the medical facility right at the very end, there was a truck on the floor. Not that dad ever got down and played with it. But it made him remember the best gift. And I want to just begin at least to conclude by saying this. The best gifts are those that you give away. The best gifts are those that you give away. Jesus is a gift to us. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. God had a son, but God gave his son away. And on that Christmas night, was there joy in heaven? Was there joy in heaven on that Christmas night when God gave his son away? Remember the words of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Letter A, give as you have received. Why could dad give that Tonka truck? You know why he could give that Tonka truck? Because he knew he had a family. He knew he wasn't an orphan. He knew there would be people to care with him, care for him. He knew that he would have love and, and he would have happiness in his home. And, and he knew that everything was going to be well because he was not an orphan. He, he had a father. And knowing that he had a father that is good and giving. Do you know that you have a father that is good and giving? The lights to give. I, I heard that saying many years ago, and I believe it's true. You can't outgive God. How many of you believe that? You can't outgive God. God blesses you with something, and you, you share it with others, and then God blesses you with more. The Bible says, freely you have received, freely give. Roman, uh, Matthew, rather, chapter 10, verse 8. Deuteronomy 16, every man will give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given. Every man will give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord. God gives unto us because he's our everlasting father. Why does he give unto us? So that we can have our needs met. So that he can take care of us. But so that we can also know the greatest joy is giving unto others. Jesus is that gift. 1 Peter 4, 10 says this, As every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As every man has received the gift. What gift? Jesus is the gift. So let's live our lives receiving all that Jesus has for us and giving his love and his life and his blessings out to others. Because joy is released. When we give what we have received, thanks be unto God for this unspeakable gift. Joy is released when we give what we have received. Last point I want to make. Would Dad have, been, would Dad have enjoyed that Tonka truck, do you think, had he kept it? I know I speculate a moment, but having seen that orphan boy, having had the opportunity to keep or to give, how long do you think the, the thrill of having that metal toy would have lasted had Dad said, no, I want to keep it for myself? It's not my fault he doesn't have anything. You see, you only, only what you give will you be able to keep forever. It's only what you give that you will be able to keep forever. God blesses us with so many things. But as we then minister them to others, we are laying up for ourselves treasure in heaven. We are laying a foundation of the time to come. We are giving that which we cannot keep anyway so that joy can be released and others can be blessed. And didn't Jesus say, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. And if you forsake houses or brothers, won't it, won't it be ministered back unto you? Didn't he say that? And so this Christmas season, let us thank God for the best gift. 
the best gift is Jesus. And if you've never received Jesus, I want you to think about that little orphan boy. That little orphan boy had to receive that gift. He had to reach out and take it. He had to unwrap it. He had to embrace it. You can believe in Jesus, but have you received Jesus? So right now, would you just open your heart and pray? Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you. Thank you that you are the greatest gift. You died on a cross for me. You rose from the dead. You're alive that I might know you. Thank you, Jesus, for the greatest gift of all. Receive him. I'm going to ask Connie to come and lead us in song and close us in song. And Connie, when you're done, would you just dismiss us in prayer? But these altars are open if you want to come and pray. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive him. He is the greatest gift. And if you have received him, then minister him to others. Amen.